Yo, 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 yo. Welcome back to Son of a Preacher, man. As always, I am your host. The incredible, the inimitable, the unstoppable, the undisputed, the notorious soap man. Here to clean your mouth out with another episode. Now, in my last episode, we talked about one of the many miracles of Moses. And we'll continue down this line with this episode because there's really no way to get around it. You know, miracles are just what this man does. And so we're going to talk about another one of Moses' many miracles. But this particular miracle it hits kind of close to home for me. It's personal. You know, it's of selective importance. It's special. Because it was the revelation of this miracle. It was the understanding of this miracle which led me to the belief that there is no poof, that this is not magic. I started not to even do this episode, man, to tell you the truth. I was a little wary. I was a little nervous because the truth of this miracle of Moses, it strikes at the heart of many traditional beliefs. It strikes at the heart of the traditional belief that this is magic that this man is doing, that it's magic that that God is doing, that he's some genie in a lamp hanging out in the clouds, waving a magic stick making stuff happen this is personal to me because i grew up under the traditional teachings of the church and it was the revelation of this miracle of moses that put me on the other side all you traditional believers i used to be one of you but it was the understanding of this miracle that set this man apart now mom say the videos are too long so without further ado Without further delay, Soap Man presents, Son of a Preacher Man presents The Wanderings, Part 6, The Fiery Serpents. Now, let me explain a little something first before we get started. Because, you know, a few episodes back, I talked about Mother So-and-So who was always talking about what the Lord said and the Lord told her. And, you know, I grew up under that umbrella, so a little of that rubbed off on me. I, too, believe the Almighty spoke to me. Okay? So, I usually don't go around telling people my business because I don't want them to think I'm insane. But it's enough insane people out there watching that... I don't too much mind no more. So when I felt like the good Lord spoke to me, I told a few people about it. I told my brother. I told my father. And if you've watched my videos, you know that my brother and father are my arch nemesis. They don't agree with anything I think. They don't agree with anything I say. So I want you to play, pay close attention to everything I say in this video, okay? So I told my old man when I thought God spoke to me and he said, well, what happened? And this is what I said back to him. I said to my father, there was no cloud of smoke. There were no flashing lights. In essence, what I was saying to my father was, there was no poof. God spoke to me and it wasn't like you would even imagine. There was no wisp of fire and brimstone. 
it was just like a revelation. It was an aha moment. But multiply it times a thousand. So I came up with the idea that there's no poof. And that's just one of my many aphorisms. Another one I came up with is it's not about what the Bible says. It's about what the Bible means, because what the Bible says can be misleading to some folks. But what I was essentially saying to my father was there is no poof. Now, the story of the fiery serpents is re relevant in this regard, because the revelation of this story is proof about other stories see if you get this story you start looking at other miracles that moses did and you compare and contrast and juxtapose and you come to an aha moment yourself in this this episode soap man gonna show and prove you best believe that by the way i've been getting a lot of uh messages about you know the original hebrews being black and I'm really trying to steer away from that argument. I'm really not trying to get into it with, with these black Hebrew Israelites about what they believe. Because to tell you the truth, honest to God, I don't care. You can go around thinking you is a Hebrew or a Spartan or call yourself Leonidas and your boys are three. I don't care. Believe whatever you want to believe. But I'm a, I have to warn you. If the black Hebrew Israelites keep texting and messaging me about how some how some original Hebrews is black, I'm going to have to do a special episode and I'm just going to have to go in. I'm sorry. It wouldn't be the first time I had to go up against some ignorant Negroes. Now, I'm going to just put it out there and y'all better just leave it dead. Don't tune in if you don't like what I'm saying. But the original Hebrews was not black. Quit trying to make yourself feel good. Quit trying to be a part of something. We got our own heroes in our community, in our culture. Quit trying to steal somebody else's identity. It's embarrassing. As a black person, it's embarrassing. Y'all don't know what you're talking about. I'm not even trying to be like, I'm not trying to get into it with y'all. But y'all just need, I mean, y'all need to read. Do some research. Stop trying to gravitate and clean going to the first shiny thing you see or hear. I'm telling you, you don't want it with the soap, man. I don't let you know right now. You know, you can keep it peaceful. I mean, and pretty much people have been keeping it peaceful, but I just see, I see the trajectory that is going down. I really ain't trying to have that fight with y'all. But if you want it, now, where were we? My understanding of this subject of the fiery serpent strikes at the very heart of traditional beliefs. The truth of this subject discredits a lot of what many traditional believers believe, and it flies in the face of some very powerful institutions, meaning the church. There's a story behind this story also. My brother Terry had a lot to do with my discovery of what the fiery serpents really were. So I'm going to tell you the story of the fiery serpents. And at the same time, I'm going to tell you how my brother inadvertently helped me solve this mystery. We begin in Numbers 21, Numbers 21, chapters 4 through 6. And it reads, And they journeyed from Mount Hor, which is Mount Sinai, by the way of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was, was much discouraged because of the way. That means it was a hard road to travel and you know, the morale was low. And the people spake against Moses, wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathed this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Now, this is pretty straightforward. We start out this episode, we start out this story like we started out many of the stories in recent, in recent episodes. With these Hebrew, with these Israelites 
complaining about their situation. They've been complaining since the day they left. God has cursed them upon cursed them upon sent curses upon curses upon them. And they still complain and they can't help themselves. And so Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through 6 talks about how they complaining again. And God is fed up. They say, we, we tired of this manna, this bread, God raining. We want fruit. We want fish. We want apple pie. Okay. We need a Snickers. And so they start complaining. And so God says, he sends fiery serpents. And they start biting the people. And the people die. Numbers 21. Verses seven through nine read, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So now, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Moses and the Hebrew people are wandering the desert. It is a time of wandering. God has cursed them to wander the desert for 40 years and die. The people are once again complaining that there is no food and water. God becomes upset and sends a plague. The plague is a plague of fiery serpents. And the Bible says these serpents bite the Hebrews. And the people begin to die. And so Moses creates a brass serpent and sets it upon a pole. And all who have been bitten when they see this brass serpent on a pole, they live and die not. Now we all on the same page. Sounds mysterious. Sounds magical, does it not? I mean, come on, come on. This is the story and the story is believed as it is written. And why shouldn't we believe the story just as it is? My brother always tells me, you always think you know. You always trying to figure something out. But you can't understand God, man. You don't know shit. And I always tell him, oh, contraire, mon frere. You know what God tells you. You know what God shows you. And you know what God wants you to know. So I tell my brother, I'm going to figure out what happened. I'm going to demystify this story. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. And he says, what is there to figure out? Ain't nothing to figure out. It told you what happened. What you mean you gonna find out what happened? It just told you what happened. Go sit your ass down somewhere. Sit your happy ass down. And accept it. But come on. Fiery serpents. People being miraculously healed just by looking at a serpent of brass on a pole. There has to be more to this story. There's something else. There's something more. There's something hidden. Now, my brother would say, no, it ain't. People like you are the problem, always thinking they can understand something, always thinking they can understand God, always thinking they can understand something that wasn't meant to be understood. You may not be aware, but this is the common belief. The story about the fiery serpents. This is the common belief even unto this day. This story is understood and taught as it stands. That Moses created a brass serpent and miraculously, magically healed these people by getting them to look at this brass serpent on a pole. This belief is so accepted, it is so prevalent this belief is so deeply rooted in our society that even reputable and well-known household institutions such as the Blue Cross and Blue Shield have taken up its mantle. The Blue Cross Blue Shield 
is a health and wellness type of institution. They are in essence an organization that promotes healing and being healthy. And their logo is the serpent on a pole or serpents on a pole. The Blue Cross Blue Shield. Well, just take a look at the pictures. You have a blue cross to your left with a man on it. Hmm, wonder who that could represent. And on the right, you have a blue shield. And on the blue shield, you have a what? Serpent on a pole. Here is the proof of how widely accepted it is that the story means what it says it means. Mind you, I'm not criticizing Blue Cross and Blue Shield for their logo. I could care less. I could care I care about what the Blue Cross and Blue Shield do about as much as I care that black Hebrew Israelites believe that the original Hebrews was black. I don't care what you believe. I'm putting out the truth as I know it as the evidence leads me to believe. I'm not pulling this out of my rear end. This is what the evidence suggests. So I'm not criticizing black Hebrew Israelites for believing what they believe. I'm not criticizing Blue Cross and Blue Shield for their logo. I don't care. As far as I know, they may just feel like, hey, we ain't saying how Moses did anything. There's a snake and a pole involved. And so that's our logo. And they don't need to explain anything to me or anything else. They can do what they want. What I want you to understand is that though you may not care about these stories, others, many in high places, do care about these biblical stories. And high places are ultimately where you are trying to get to. So... Organizations like the Blue Cross and Blue Shield are unabashedly or have unabashedly joined themselves to the hip with what is believed that the Bible is talking about. Our judicial system, our justice system, our educational system, our moral system, all of these things are heavily influenced by what the Bible says or rather not exactly what the Bible means, but what we think it means. What we think the Bible says and what we think it means heavily influences our day-to-day -day lives, whether you know it or not. The Blue Cross and Blue Shield is saying, we're two feet in on this belief. And though I can't prove people like, and though I can't prove People believe in poof and magic. I know they do because I came up under that same doctrine as everyone else. The Blue Cross, well, as most people, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, by using the serpent on a pole as their logo, are deliberately letting you know what they believe and what they are all about. They plaster this logo on their buildings, on billboards, on signs. They are letting you know time and time again what they are about. And once again, I must say there's nothing wrong with that. Believe what you want. Do what you want. I've heard a number of preachers preach on this subject on the fiery serpents. And let me tell you, I've not heard not one of them get it right. Not one pastor, preacher, scholar, individual has correctly has correctly broken down this story in the Bible. Not one of them has gotten it right. And so they sit in front, they sit in front of their church, in front of the members of their church, and they get all geeked and jump up and down and get filled with I don't know what it is. And they're wrong. They're completely wrong. They're understanding of this story of this miracle and what happened is zip zilch nada they don't understand it so they getting all tribal and geeked and happy and excited about something they don't even understand it's amazing to me it's amazing the blue cross blue shield 
they jump right on the bandwagon and like, ah, yeah, rah, 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 yeah, serpent on a pole. Magic, poof, poof, poof. Genie in a lamp, we're down with it. But look, hey, it's they money, it's they time, it's they organization. They can put whatever they want on their signs and billboards and buildings. Hey, make a bumper sticker, get a tattoo, I don't care. What I need my audience to know is that the traditional belief of what this story means is accepted across a wide space, across millions and millions upon, he probably even billions of people. And it is an incorrect, incoherent understanding of what happened. But I'm gonna tell you what happened. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot it to you straight this episode. Look, it is even believed that Moses' brass serpent on the pole is representative of Jesus being crucified on the cross. And of course it is. Of course it is. Human beings are quick to make connections to, some, to stuff that don't even need to be connected. There, nowhere in Moses' story did he mention Jesus or elude to the coming of Jesus. If I'm wrong, leave a comment in the comment section. And I'm not saying the serpent on a pole is not representative of Jesus on the cross. I think in the Bible somewhere it says just as Moses put up his serpent on a pole, Christ will be put up on a cross. But that doesn't mean that when Moses made the brass serpent and put it on a pole, he was thinking of Jesus or even knew about him. But correct me if I'm wrong. I'm human. I'm wrong sometimes. I have never seen evidence of the connection. I have never seen evidence of Moses doing this, putting this serpent on a pole to represent the coming and crucifixion of Christ. I don't see the evidence other than people making the connection of their own cognition, of people just understanding it that way without evidence. So I tell my brother, I'm going to solve this mystery of the fiery serpents. And it takes me three years to do it. Three years, count them up, one, two, three. So I come back to my, my brother three years later. Three years, three years. Three years it took me to figure this out. Three years. How many of your pastors have spent three years on any subject of the Bible? Three years it took me to figure this out. I dedicated three years to this one subject so i come back to my brother three years after i tell him i'm gonna figure this out i come back to him with my theory on what these fiery serpents were and what they were all about and he doesn't buy it he doesn't believe me he says i wasn't there i can't prove anything and my proof is not proof and so you can imagine how frustrated i was now i don't blame him because his thing is, why should I believe you? You're just one dude in a million who thinks he knows. Everybody thinks they know. And you just another one of them people. He says, look, the fiery serpents are the holy seraphim, man. Angels of God. Sent by God. Why do you feel like you can figure out what he did, let alone what he did thousands of years ago i brought my idea to my old man of course he said i didn't know what i was talking about big surprise right he never thinks i know what i'm talking about he said son 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 you don't know the power of god the devil has your mind twisted i pray for that demon of confusion to come out So I said to him, I say to him, oh, wise one, if I'm so wrong, then why don't you tell me what's right? Why don't you give me the answer out of all your holy knowledge and wisdom? 
Tell me where I'm wrong at. Don't just insult me and criticize me and put me down and tell me I'm stupid and possessed. Educate me. If you disagree with what I think it is, tell me what you think it is. Now, this is what my father did. And I got my Bible with me right now. And I don't know if your Bible does this. This is not a teaching Bible, but my father had a teaching Bible. And what I mean by teaching Bible is for every verse and line that is a is in the Bible. If you go down to the bottom of a page, there's an explanation for what that particular verse means. So he flips in his through his teaching Bible. He gets to the verse and he goes down to the teaching part and he says the fiery serpents were now listen closely he says they were either serpents that came to bite the people real serpents or or they were heavenly spiritual beings now i want to ask you something if I ask you for directions and you say, well, it's either this way or that way. Don't that mean you don't know when my father read this to me out of the Bible? I said, oh, my God. And I, like, I said it audibly and loudly. I said, oh, my God. He said what? I said they don't know. I said, the people who supposed to know don't know, because when you say when I ask you a question, and you reply, it's either this or that. That means you don't know. Do you agree with me? Leave a, leave a comment in the comment section. Okay? Let me know. But this is what I'm going to ask you. Is it just one badass snake on fire that bit these people? Or what? Because it's millions of Hebrews. So are you telling me one badass snake on fire came and bit each individual? Or are you telling me millions of snakes on fire? Are you listening to what I'm saying? Are you suggesting that millions? First of all, it's impossible for a snake to be on fire and live. So you're not just saying it was one bad fiery snake. You're saying millions of snakes on fire, as ridiculous as that sounds, came up and bit these people. Now, let me ask you this. What did the people not see the snakes coming? You mean to tell me you let a snake on fire bite you? You didn't see him coming a mile away? Why didn't you grab a broom? Was you scared the broom was going to catch on fire? Why didn't you grab a stick? The Hebrews were armed. They had spears, knives, swords. Why didn't you fight the snakes? Why does this story not transition into a battle between man and beast? I'll tell you why. Because when God fights you, it's not a fight. You can't fight back. When God plagues you, you just going to take it. I mean, I suppose you can fight back. You can try. It's futile. So to suggest that these was rattlesnakes or cobras engulfed in flames is just ludicrous. It's beyond me that people actually accept this belief it's embarrassing and that's why i told my brother i said look i have to get to the bottom of this because this just doesn't make sense i cannot accept this story just as is i can't do it so i tell my father look both of those answers that you gave were wrong. 
And the people who are supposed to know don't know. These people, these people are printing commentaries in the Bibles that's probably sitting on your shelf and they don't know. Jesus said in Matthew to some of the Sadducees that came to him and tried to catch him up in his words. They asked him a question about marriage in heaven. And Jesus said to them, you don't know scripture and you don't know the power of God. Now, he was talking to the people who were experts in that field, and he's telling them, you have no idea what you're talking about. He's telling the people who are supposed to know, the go-to people, that you don't understand anything. And that's what I'm telling you. Most people who think they understand the Bible, including the black Hebrew Israelites, but not even just them, Jewish rabbis, priests, Christians, black Hebrew Israelites, Catholics, Pentecostals, Methodists, Lutheran. It does not matter. The title doesn't matter. Most people, even people who have studied the Bible their entire lives, do not understand it but that's why there's a soap man and by the end of this episode there will not be a doubt in your mind that what i say is the truth let's keep it going so i had this little theory on what the fiery serpents could be and it took me three years to develop it come on three years and no one believed it no one even wanted to hear it Frustrated but yet determined, my resolve was to find more proof, irrefutable proof that I was right. I remember me and my brother got in, my, me and my brother Terry got into a very big argument over it. We got into several big arguments over it, actually, staying up to two, three, four o'clock in the morning arguing and fighting about this. And I vowed that I would not rest until I found sufficient evidence that would shut his ignorant ass up once and for all. It took me an additional two years. That's five years in all. Three years, he rejected it. It took me two more years. I came back and I found irrefutable proof that I was right. I found the answer and the proof I needed in the method in which Moses used to heal the bitten Hebrews, the brass serpent on a pole. You see, the first thing you must understand to understand anything involving Moses is that Moses is a genius. And if there's a problem, or when there's a problem, Moses is going to rely on his genius to solve it. Moses is a, I know you're tired of hearing me say that, but it is, if you can't understand, if you can't grasp the fact that Moses is a genius, you can't leave that out. It is, it is an integral component to his miracles and the understanding of them. Moses is a genius and this brass serpent is his answer to the problem of the fiery serpents biting the people. So, this antidote that Moses comes up with, it should relate to the poison that's plaguing the people. Moses' antidote for the fiery serpents is this brass serpent on a pole. There should be some sort of relationship between the problem and the solution. I mean, if this is proof, if Moses, if what Moses did was poof, then there needs to be no relation between the solution and the problem. All Moses got to do is say, Alakazam. All he's got to do is say, Shazam, Abracadabra, and poof, the people are healed. But if it's not poof, if it's not magic, then why would he create a brass serpent and put it on a pole to heal the, pe to heal the people? I'll tell you why, because this ain't this ain't Dungeons and Dragons, fool. This is real life. People are dying. And he comes up with a real life solution to help these people. If this is poof, then anything goes, because with poof, there is no rhyme or reason. Things just magically happen. But if I'm right, 
and there is no such thing as poof, then there must, hear me, there must be a scientific, a definable, a probable relationship, a provable, I'm sorry, not probable, a provable relationship. There has to be a scientific relationship between problem and solution. There has to be a definable, definable, a provable relationship between the problem and the solution. It should at least, if nothing else, make sense. Be it direct or indirect or inversely proportionate or related, there is some type of relationship between the problem that God sent fiery serpents to bite the people and the solution that Moses came up with, which is a brass serpent on a pole to heal them. Now you may say, well, so man, the relationship is the snakes. Snakes bit the people and Moses used a brass replica of a snake to heal them. There goes your, there goes your relationship. Yeah, well, about those snakes that bit the people. I want to talk to you about that. And what I have to say about the snakes is whoever said they were snakes in the first place? Because the Bible uses the word serpents. And because the Bible uses the word serpents, when you see the word serpents in your mind, you automatically equate that to mean snakes. I tell you what my uncle Cecil used to always tell me when I played him in chess. He would say, who paid you to think? And so I say that to you. When you saw serpents and you thought snake, who paid you to think? I'm glad I didn't. I tell you this. I believe I've solved this mystery. And though I may have failed in convincing my brother and father, I myself am thoroughly convinced and I hope to convince you through common sense and science. And as for, as far as the fiery serpents being snakes, turns out, whole time, they weren't snakes at all. And whoever said they were, other than you. See, that's what I mean by the Bible can be misleading. Listen to me say it again. Turns out, whole time, the fiery serpents, including the serpent of brass, they weren't snakes at all. Remember this, folks. It's not about what the Bible says. It's about what the Bible means. Let's go back to the original verse Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through 6. And let's see if we can find some clues. As always, we use scripture. Not our beliefs. Not my opinion. We use scripture as our point of reference. It says, Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through 6. And it reads. And they journeyed from Mount Hor, which is Mount Sinai by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against Moses, wherefore have you brought us up out of, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? I have in big bold red print, for there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread, meaning the manna that fell from the sky. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much of the and much people of Israel died now see if you can absorb that into that sophisticated complex brain of yours and if you notice I got my sound I got my sound on point today there will be no interruptions okay there will be no go back and rewind and loop it no 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 the, the genius of Moses has rubbed off on the soap man, okay? And now I have used my genius to solve a problem. Anywho, in my very first video, I said that one of the biggest mistakes that people make when reading the Bible is that they forget that this book was written thousands of years ago and that, wor and that words that meant one thing back when it was written 
don't always have the same meaning as they do now. Today, we identify the word serpent with snake. But in Moses' day, the word snake did not exist. As a matter of fact, there was no category for many species of animals. In Moses' of, in Moses's day, you would have called just about anything that slithered or crawled or inched its way along a serpent. And if it was in the water, you would have called it a water serpent. Or do you think in Moses' day they called a eel a eel? Also, the Bible gives you a clue as to what it's talking about. I often tell people, whenever you come to a part in the Bible that you do not understand or that does not make sense, go back a few sentences or go below a few sentences or even go back a few verses or paragraphs to get some type of context. Context is everything when reading and interpreting the Bible. I have here highlighted in big bold red print some very important clues. The people are complaining that there is no food or there is no bread and there is no water. Could there be a relationship between the fiery serpents and the lack of food and water? I believe it is. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the fiery serpent of the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are seeing on your screen are the fiery serpents that, Mo that Moses spoke of over 3,000 years ago. I give you what my brother said could not be done. Here's looking at you, Terry. I give you Dracoon Culeasis, also known as the Guinea Worm. It is a parasitic worm that is found in different parts of Africa and the Middle East. Now, I know what you're thinking. The first thing you're thinking is this is very disappointing because I've taken the magic out of your miracle. And I'm sorry for that. I really apologize. But I wasn't the one that put the magic in there in the first place. And neither did the Bible. You did, my friend. You did. And what I want to show everybody is how easy it is to get it wrong. How easy it is to get the Bible wrong. You just can't pick up this book, the, the word of God, and say to yourself, aha, I've got it. Now, let me tell you what else you think. And you're thinking to yourself, hey, soap man, that doesn't look like a worm. Well, my friend, that's because this here little critter is still in its larva state. It doesn't become a worm until after it until after it's been ingested and is in your digestive tract. I know what you're thinking. Well, soap man, how does that happen? Well, thank you for asking. I'd like to tell you how that how it happens. This parasite is found in contaminated water. Let me say that again. This parasite is found in contaminated water. And when some poor unfortunate soul drinks that contaminated water containing the Dracoon Culeasis larvae, they become infected. Now, this should set off some alarm bells. This parasite is found in water. Hmm. Was this not the very thing that the Hebrews were complaining of? A lack of food and water? If we go back, it says... Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? The Hebrews are complaining. They say, because there is no bread and there is no water. Now I'm giving you a possible solution to this. And this parasite is found in dirty, contaminated water. So maybe a better way to read the verse or that, that the verse could be written is to say that there is no food 
There is no bread and there is no clean water. But do you see how this relates to what the Bible is saying. The people are complaining there is no food and water. And here, here you have a parasite, which I can prove existed where they were because this, this disease has all been pretty much eradicated today. But 3000 years ago, it was alive and well and running rampant in the area that Moses and the Hebrews were. So I give you a parasite that lives in dirty water and these people are complaining that there is not sufficient bread or water. So if you die of thirst and starvation, are you going to drink some dirty water? I think most people would. And if you did drink this dirty water, you would be infected with this parasite. So... There is a relationship here between the story that the Bible gives and the science of this world. Anyway, the infection process works as such. An individual drinks water contaminated with the Dracoon Culeasis larvae. While in the host's digestive tract, meaning their stomach or intestines, the larva hatches from its hard outer shell, its hard encasing. And once it hatches, it penetrates the intestine's wall. I got a diagram up here. Look, folks, this is science. All you new booty people coming up with these crazy ideas, you pulling rabbits out your hat. You're pulling it out of your rectum. What I'm giving you is proven science. I'm not giving you what I think. I'm not giving you, I'm not telling you my opinion. And I don't want yours. I want facts. I'm giving you a diagram of how this disease comes about. So a person drinks contaminated water with the Dracoon Culeasis. And I don't know if I'm saying it right. Do I look like a, 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 a scientist to you? So a person, an individual drinks water contaminated with the larvae of Dracoon Culeasis while in the host's digestive tract, it hatches from its hard outer encasing and penetrates the intestine's wall. It migrates as it matures. So as it grows, it migrates, making its way to the skin surface. And it usually emerges from a person's calf or foot. Now I'm gonna give you my opinion, just real quick. I think it emerges from the foot. And as you see, I don't know if you can see my little arrow here. You see these little red lines showing that it migrates down a person's leg. It usually emerges out of there, doesn't have to, but 98% of the time or 90 something percent of the time, it comes out of the calf or the foot. And I think that's due to just simple gravity. And that's pretty much the gist of it. Drink this contaminated water with the dracoon larvae and approximately 10 months to a year later, you'll have a spaghetti sized worm hanging out of your leg or foot. And it'll be hanging around until it fully emerges or somehow gets snagged and torn off. And the misery doesn't end there. You see, this parasite has a very peculiar way of freeing itself from your flesh. The female worm, which it usually is, releases waste, which is toxic to the human body. This causes the skin to blister, which eventually bursts into an open wound, allowing the parasitic worm to be seen and emerge. In essence, what I'm saying is to free itself from your body, the guinea worm essentially burns its way out of your flesh. Let me say that again. It burns its way out. Now, if that doesn't ring your bell, nothing will because that relates to the story. It's literally called the fiery serpent. And here I have a diagram for all the 
slow, ignorant, and inept. I got a diagram here for you to follow. If you can't read, leave a comment in the comment section. I'll read it to you. But no, you want to believe in dungeons and dragons, snakes on fire. There's something else. As the guinea worm, quote unquote, burns itself free, the natural reaction of the host is to emerge the affected area into water. Now this benefits the guinea worm. You see, by the time the female worm emerges, she has already made it and had her eggs fertilized. Yeah, that's right. She had a hotel suite for her honeymoon down in your digestive tract, in your intestines, is where she had her honeymoon. So she didn't already got knocked up. And by the time she burns her way free, she's ready to deliver. The, the unfortunate host of the guinea worm soaks his or her burning body part in water and the female guinea worm simply releases all of her fertilized eggs into that water source. This process is repeated with every host infected by the parasite. So in the case of the Hebrews, you have thousands if not millions of infected people repopulating the drinking water with this parasite which in turn infects millions more or thousands to millions more people so you see this isn't some fairy tale about fiery snakes or spiritual angelic snakes or supernatural snakes this is reality there is a very real problem occurring you need to get your head out of you culo because this is not something you can fight. This was of God. There is no fighting back. There is no defense. You see, you can fight a flaming snake. Scary as that may be. You can fight them. You can scream at it. You can stomp at it. You can kick dust at it. You can try to scare it off. You can beat it with a stick. You can chop it with a sword or axe. You can, you can beat it with a broom, smack it with a stick. I'm not saying you will be successful or victorious, but you can mount a resistance. You can fight back. I mean, if it's a snake on fire, it ain't like you ain't going to see it coming. And if nothing else, throw water on it. It's on fire for God's sakes. Spit on it. Throw water on it. Pee on it. Come on. Now the guinea worm may emerge from various body parts as seen in this slide, but I suspect because of gravity, more than 90% of the time it emerges from the calf or foot. That's just my theory that it's that gravity is the cause of it emerging from the calf or the foot 90% of the time. Now these open wounds created by this parasite are liable to become infected and due to a lack of medical supplies and resources in the desert along with a lack of education and technology due to the fact that this happened over 3,000 years ago many of these people who got infected they died and these wounds depending on the circumstances can be pretty nasty not to mention pretty gross look at this dude's foot this worm got this dude's foot looking like a bowl of noodle soup from the olive garden i mean imagine what that would do to your swag to have a spaghetti sized worm hanging out your leg or foot now i know what you're thinking you're thinking to yourself, just yank it out. Rambo your way through the pain. Grab that little sucker, wrap it around your, your finger, and just snatch it right out. Well, you don't want to go and do that. Because you see, if you tear or cut the worm in two, you'll never be able to get the rest of it out. 
which will almost surely cause an infection of which you have no means or resources to treat. But Moses does because you see Moses is a genius. And what that means is regardless of what obstacle he finds in his path, in his path, regardless to the problem he encounters, you are going to witness the miracles of this man's mind to solve it. How many times must I say it? How many episodes must I dedicate giving you example after example, instance after instance of this man's mental prowess who knows no equal under the sun, not then, not now, not ever, save Jesus Christ himself. So how exactly did Moses confront this conundrum numbers chapter 21 7 through 9 says therefore the people came to Moses and said we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us and Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said unto Moses make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, forgive the misspelled words and all that. I read it right. I wrote it wrong. Now, that's besides the point. The point is... This verse tells us what Moses did to save the people. But what does it mean? He puts a serpent of brass on a pole for people to look at. That doesn't make any sense. It took me two additional years to figure out this riddle. And in order for me to be correct, the solution must relate to the problem. So check this out. I got this African homie named Ty. His, his name is Tailfit. We call him, we call him Ty. We call him Ty for short. So I was telling my African homie Ty about, hold on, hold on y'all. Somebody calling me. It's a real annoying person calling me right now and I must silence this phone. Okay. So I was talking to my African homie Ty. And I was telling my African homie Ty about the guinea worm and how I thought it was the fiery serpents that the Bible spoke of. So I began, now he's Muslim, so he, he's not privy to many stories in the Bible. So I began telling him about this parasitic worm, but since he's from that part of the world, he's from Nigeria, he was already quite familiar with it. I began telling him how Moses helped the people infected by this worm. I'm telling him how Moses healed the people with it, with this miraculous mind of his. But before I could even get it out, he blurted it out. He said, oh, yo, yo, those are the worm. You roll it up on a stick. Roll it up on a stick, he said. Now, don't you feel silly? If you was one of those people who thought it was poof, you thought Moses was magically healing these folks by getting them to just look. And that pastor who was jumping up and down and getting his whole congregation geeked off of poof and magic was dead wrong. Roll it upon a stick, says Moses. Moses tells the people to roll it upon a stick. How does Moses communicate this to millions of people 3,000 years ago before there was text, before there was Twitter, before there was Instagram? He places a bright serpent made of brass so everybody can see it is nice and bright. He places a brass replica on a 
tall pole and sticks it in the ground so everybody can see it. And when they see it, they understand what to do. It's brief, it's to the point, it's effective, it is genius. So what you gotta say? You think I'm wrong for mocking the preacher? For be you think I'm wrong for mocking the preacher? The preacher who got so geek, and it's not my father. I don't think I've ever really, not that I can remember, I've, I don't remember him teaching on this. He might have mentioned it, but I don't remember him ever having a sermon going deep into this. You know, maybe glossing over it and talking about how great God he is in the process. But for the pastors that was so geeked thinking this was magic, you think I'm wrong for talking about them? You think I'm wrong for mocking them? You think I'm going to be condemned to hell? Well, let me tell you what I think. I think I have no reason to fear someone who don't know what they're talking about. I have no reason to fear the pastor. If God was with him, then he would understand and have the right answer. If God be with me, who can stand against me? And so there is no cause to fear pastors, presidents, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, dogs, cats, lions, and tigers, and bears. Oh my. No need. And so I don't. And ain't nobody even trying to play tough or act like they something they ain't. But I take the Bible very seriously. And when I see foolish mortals come along one day and feel like they want to be religious all of a sudden, I find it extremely insulting. When I see people jumping up and down, kicking themselves in the behind, clicking their heels and about something they think they understand and they are dead wrong, it is surreal for me. When I see imbeciles who feel like they want to be religious all of a sudden, I find it extremely insulting on the Lord's behalf that you feel that you could understand the word of God. Because, just because, or because you want to, or because you think you smart. I mean, I've been studying this book for over 30 years, and I count the little bit I know as nothing. But for you new booty Negroes who woke up one day and decided this would be cool, or even you old school pastors in your shiny suits with the edges so straight they could probably skewer a wild boar. And even these modern day televangelists, let me tell you something. It is thoroughly entertaining when I hear you dance around the subject matter and play it safe. When you speak vaguely about a subject because you don't understand the details of what you're speaking of. When you err, when you embellish and decorate, when you misquote, when you misrepresent or take out of context or when you just flat out lie. I swear to you. It is truly entertaining to the point it makes my life worth living because I'm astounded by the incompetence. But let me tell you what's even more. When I look into the vastness of your audience and I realize that you've just convinced and deceived a massive amount of people and they think you know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's still entertaining, but it's more like watching a scary movie entertaining. It is surreal because millions of people are being deceived and misled on such a wide scale. And because I understand the genius of Moses and who gave him that genius, I suspect vast numbers of people are being led not only into a trap, and into misunderstanding, but to their doom. The Bible says a man does what he perceives to be right and it leads to his death. I urge you to try to see things ahead of time to avoid them. And that's why I make these videos because like Moses and the fiery serpents, if you can discover the truth of something, then you will acquire enlightenment. That means upgrade. You become smarter. And in a world where knowledge is power, becoming smarter is a very good thing. Remember this, folks, and this is a slide here of 
a, 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 some replica, I don't know where it is, in Israel, in the Middle East. I don't even know why I included this slide. Anywho, remember this, folks. It's not about what the Bible says. It's about what the Bible means. What that means is it's easy to get lost in the sauce. You'll notice that the Bible is about the most accessible book ever made. There's almost one in every household. It has sold, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, more than 5 billion copies. There used to be one in every hotel room. What I'm trying to say is it's easy to get your hands on God's word. But it's almost impossible to understand it. It's easy to get your hands on God's word. And why should it, and, and, you know, and why shouldn't it be? The reason it's easy to get your hands on God's word, because you can't understand it. God's like, hey, you want to steal my word? You want to, you know. I'm not, Go ahead. You can't understand it anyway. You want to use my word to become all powerful? Roll the dice. You're not going to understand it anyway. You having this, this book is, is almost like a weapon. And you having it means nothing. It's like you got a gun and you don't know how to take the safety off. So even though this book is the most powerful thing in the world, in the wrong hands, it's useless. You're not gonna understand it anyway. If I were God, why would I be afraid of you having something you don't know how to use? I'd say, keep it. When you're done playing with it, it'll collect dust on your shelf. This book is so easily accessible because it's so hard to understand. But the soap man's gonna help you, okay? So here's the first thing you need to know, all right? Context is everything, okay? It's not about what the Bible says, it's about what the Bible means because context is everything. That's the first thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know is this, Genesis chapter eight, Verse 22 says, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Now, what does that mean, soap man? What that means is there is no poof. We've come to the part in this episode where I thank you for joining me on this episode of Son of a Preacher Man. If you have any comments, be you black, Hebrew, Israelite or not. Look, I've got nothing against the black, Hebrew, Israelites. He's just trying to take me off of, down a path I'm not trying to go. I appreciate you watching. I appreciate your comments. I appreciate your input. But if you keep messaging me with, messaging me with this foolishness, I'm going to have to turn my sights and put you in my crosshairs, baby. All right? Anyways, I'll see you next time. Same soap time, same soap channel. And we out.